in the forgotten. This little video just reminds us that there are forgotten people all around us, that we may see them. Uh, sometimes they're forgotten. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 25 in two weeks, talking about people that Jesus identified. And he says, if you're a follower of me, you care about these people. Call them the forgotten people of the world. Why don't you take out your missions brochure real quick. Um, you were given one when you came in. Turn the inside flap. It says a schedule. The majority of these events are events that happen on a weekly basis here regardless of whether it's missions week or not. I want you to make note, first of all, of the prayer meeting that we'll be having on Monday the 18th. That's not a normal event here or a regularly scheduled event. And then the potluck on Saturday. All the other events, you're welcome to attend. So you may say, well, there's a women's Bible study on Wednesday. I don't usually go to that. They're opening your door, their doors, and you can come free of charge. How about that, right? Doesn't cost you a dime. You can come. Um, but love to have you come to any of them. All right, we'll be focusing on missions. Uh, there'll be a, uh, a speaker at each of those who will share about the ministry that they're involved in here and around the world. So I have this feeling that if you don't put it on your calendar, you won't come. I don't know. That's just me. I'm just thinking. Right, so, so plan to be here uh, starting next Monday night. Uh, as Steve indicated this week begins kind of a three-week series. I have this feeling that uh, most people, lives aren't changed by one sermon or one week. So we got three weeks where we're talking about essentials of the Christian life, starting with prayer. Next week, Kevin will be talking about ministry and service. And then the third week, we're talking about missions. All of these are not requirements of a believer, but they are a reflection of a believer. If we are in truly followers of Christ, these are things that we need to be involved in, things that we need to be doing to reach our community and our world. So I uh, encourage you with that. I do want to begin this morning with a word of prayer since we're going to be talking about prayer. Um, my phone says at 9.30 this morning, Irma hit landfall in Florida. I don't know if that's the Keys or the coast, but uh, there is great need there. I failed to mention in the first service, Awana kicks off this week. Uh, you'll see some people walking around with their Awana jerseys on. Um, Awana is our greatest outreach at Faith Community Church. More non-Faith Community Church people, particularly children, will attend Awana this year. Uh, and so they will hear the gospel. Uh, many come from other churches, um, but uh, many are unchurched. And so this is our greatest outreach. So if you want to get involved in a powerful ministry, they have needs for people who can just Listen. So all that requires pretty much is to have ears, right? Um, they need listeners. They need volunteers just for crowd control, right? So if you just understand a police state and know how to do that, I'm sure they can use you in some way, shape, or form. But um, Awana is a critical ministry. begins this week. We want to pray for that, but also for the needs of the world around us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, hurricanes... And devastating events draw us to our knees, and rightfully so. So we call upon you to intervene in the lives of so many uh, where uh, destruction is, is possible. And we pray that uh, you would provide incredible protection, but far more importantly, that you would provide an opportunity for your word to touch lives who in the moment that they've lost everything humanly would realize that they need something far greater. And so we pray that uh, there would be a great work of, of the gospel in the midst of difficult times. We pray also for Awana, Lord. We pray that as children come, as they hear, memorize, and are taught the scriptures, that it would take root, take hold in their lives. And you would bring the workers to help and bring the children to hear. And we trust you for great things. We ask in this hour, Lord, you challenge our hearts toward the simplest of things, and that is talking to you. In which your name we pray. Amen. So last week, the president declared last Sunday a day of prayer for the nation, for the victims of Harvey in Houston, and, and that, that's a good thing. Then along came Irma, and following Irma is Jose, and there's Katia. If you don't know who Katia is, Katia is the west coast of Mexico, heading toward an area that had an 8.0 earthquake this week. So you have an earthquake, and then followed by a hurricane. Probably prayer is in order there. In our ministry, Good News Joan Prison Ministry, 
placed chaplains in jails and prisons. One of our key supporters here in the state of Maryland for many years, George Brown. George fell off his bike last Sunday, suffered a severe brain injury, he's been in a coma ever since. Prayer would be in order. I received on Wednesday our latest complaint. We have inmates who file complaints against chaplains all the time for violating their religious rights. And uh, normally they're handled in administrative procedures and, and never sees the, the light of day. But in this particular case, it's been filed in U.S. District Court. And on Wednesday, my, our organizational attorney punted and said, sorry, not my ball of wax. You need to go find another attorney. So I got to find somebody by Tuesday in Greenbelt. I do have an appointment. So, uh, but it's a good thing to pray about, right? Because I'm not an attorney, even though I do play one on television. So, um, but all good, legitimate needs for prayer. But why does it come to this? Why does it take tragedy, medical extreme conditions for God's people to call upon his name? Now, you might think, well, I don't, I'm not sure it's that bad. I mean, John, let's be honest. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of people who pray and, and God is listening. 2010, there was a conference. 2,000 pastors and church leaders got together. The title of the conference was The Powerful Prayer Life of a Praying Pastor. And according to a friend of mine who attended the conference, at no time during the conference was there any prayer time. Okay? And in the conference, somebody suggested that 80% of pastors do not have a regular disciplined time of prayer. What does that mean? It means the people that are being paid to pray don't necessarily even do it. So I'm just thinking if they're not doing it, probably a lot of us are not either. Manny Mills, a friend of mine, grew up in Cuba. Manny came to the States in the 60s, in the 80s, he found himself in a criminal lifestyle such that he ran from the FBI, went to Venezuela. Thought that was a good place to hide. The FBI sought him there, but while he was there, he came to faith in Christ, came back to the United States, turned himself in to the authorities. Spent three years in federal prison for a whole bunch of stuff. Then when he got out, he went to Wheaton College as a Chuck Colson scholar. Chuck Colson has set up a scholarship for ex-offenders so they can be trained for ministry, graduated from the program, started Koinonia House, a ministry in Chicago for ex-offenders as they come out to help them transition and, and uh, work in the gospel. And Manny wrote in his book, a book is called Radical Prayer. He said, I was having lunch with some ministry partners. The owner of the, came to our table, said the police were on the phone, wanted to talk to me. The call was to inform me that my dear wife Barbara had been involved in a traffic accident. Friend drove me to the site. My anxiety turned to shock when I saw our car turned on the driver's side, all four wheels facing me. Barbara was still inside. I wanted to rush to her aid, but a friend restrained me. He assured me they had everything under control. I wasn't so sure they did. Manny, I need you to be calm, cool, and collected, police chief said. Next, he declared, the only thing you can do is pray. Those words hit me hard. They pierced my heart. Inside of me, I cried out, how can I treat God like a paramedic, calling on him only when there's an emergency? Waves of desperation, hypocrisy overwhelmed me as the chief began to pray. There on the sidewalk, the Spirit of God began exposing my shallowness toward God. The very God I had supposedly served faithfully and championed tirelessly in ministry for 20 years. When Barbara was finally transferred to the ambulance, I went to her. She had suffered a degloving, complete tearing away of three fingers on her left hand. Yet to my amazement, her first question was, how's the lady who hit me? Here I was, a visible ministry leader, champion for the least of these. I was angry, angry that such trauma would come upon my family, especially Barbara. But my seriously wounded wife was the one who sang hymns of praise to God in her fight to remain conscious for the 90 minutes she was trapped. And now she was demonstrating concern for the woman who drove through the red light and hit her. What had happened to me? I was a man who once had a vibrant personal prayer life, wrote a book talking about the great things that God had done, and here I was confronted with my hypocrisy. That's Manny's testimony. Probably many of our testimonies. So why not? Why don't we call upon the name of the Lord? and communicate him faithfully. Well, let me suggest you a couple excuses, right? I'm gonna give you a couple excuses that you can use if you like. The first one is this, I'm too busy. 
I just don't have time. That one's easy. So you got time for football. You got time for tailgating. And you even have time for Facebook. Yes, I went there. Mm Mm-hmm. Secondly, maybe you just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. You're being honest. Or maybe you're afraid of what might happen. Maybe once upon a time, God was transforming your life and it was a painful process and that's a discomfort you're not interested in repeating. I prayed for patience one year. That was not a good idea. (laughs) Just so you know. Or maybe your sense is, I got this. Life's going pretty well. I feel blessed. Not sure I need a whole lot of help at the moment. Or maybe the problem is we just really don't even know what prayer is. Maybe we just haven't embraced what God wants to do with us. I want to put a definition of prayer up on the screen here. It's a lot of words. It's going to stay here the whole time, okay? So If you don't listen, you can just memorize. So you're going to spend the whole time memorizing there. Prayer, a most essential activity of the Christian's communion relationship with God, through which the believer worships, honors, and thanks the Creator while seeking wisdom, instruction, grace, and intervention from the only one who is able to grant such requests. Do it in one breath. Where do you get a definition like that? Well, it actually comes from the Scriptures. We're going to go whirlwind through this. Communion relationship, don't turn there, but Genesis chapter 2 and 3, God has created Adam and Eve, he's put them in the garden, and it's clear that he comes regularly, maybe daily, and he walks with them, and he talks with them, and we know this, because when he shows up on the day that they've sinned, they've hidden away, and God says, "Um, where are you? And in that moment, their relationship with God had been severed because of sin, and so Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, they no longer can have that, that type of conversation with God, because of their sinfulness. Fast forward to the New Testament. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Christ's most famous and lengthy sermon in the scriptures. Three chapters called the Sermon on the Mount. 109 verses. 20 of them, or 20% give or take, deal with prayer. That suggests to us that prayer is pretty important. And we come to chapter 6, verse 9, the most quoted scripture, I believe, in history. Many churches today will quote this scripture. What is it? It's the Lord's Prayer. The disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he says, pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, in true prayer, we worship, honor, and thank the Creator. You, Lord, are worthy of glory. You, Lord, are worthy of honor. You, Lord, are worthy of praise. You're worthy of thanks. To you, Lord, we speak. And when we speak, we acknowledge something. We acknowledge that you are God, and we are not. While seeking, then we seek. What are we seeking? Well, first of all, we seek wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, that would be all of us, let him ask of God who gives. We need instruction. The disciples who were walking with Jesus said, Lord, teach us how to pray. We need grace, Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the only way you can be saved, by the grace of God. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We need grace, saving grace. We need God's intervention. Hurricane Irma has gone west, just a little bit. It was supposed to go right up through the middle of Florida. It's going to go a little west. Does that mean there's not going to be devastation? No, there's going to be a lot of trouble. But I don't think it's going to be as bad. You say, well, we just got lucky. Or is the Lord responding? Is God intervening? That was my prayer. Lord, intervene. Move it. Send it west. The only one who is able... For several years, I was a camp counselor. I had 10 seven-year-olds all by myself. Overnight camp, by the way. (laughs) I was 17 years old, and I played mother to them. And we had the chop, chop, ship, shape, 
thing. I only did it for a year. After that, I moved on. I said, I need somebody else. But I had, one of the things that you discover as a camp counselor is there's nothing you can do to these kids, right? There's nothing you can do to them, and there's really no way to make them do anything. As parents, we've kind of figured that one out too, right? It's almost impossible to make them do anything. But particularly as a counselor, you can't touch them, right? All you can do is hope that they're going to listen. Well, I had Blue Mills, true name, Blue Mills, seven-year-old. And Blue Mills was the epitome of, you can't make me do that. So it was a constant struggle with Blue. So one day, my, my norm was to make sure that they ate their vegetables, right? We're all going to eat vegetables, small uh, spoonful. So we're at lunch, second, third day, camp, whatever. And here we are, Blue's got green beans on his plate, and he ain't eating them. And I told him, we're not leaving until you eat them. So lunch ended, all the rest of the kids went back to the cabins, and there sat me and Blue and the beans. And I guarantee you, there's probably only about five beans on this plate, right? So this is not a, hard, a large undertaking, but Blue's going to eat these beans. The kitchen cleaned up, their crew was done, here we sat, me, Blue, and the beans. Rest period ended, the kids went to pool time, me, Blue, and the beans. I'm starting to get tired, but I was like, this kid is not going to win this battle, right? So finally I decided, I said to Blue, I said, Blue, you're either going to eat those beans or you're going to wash that plate. He ate them. Five seconds. Now, why didn't I have thought of that two hours ago? That would have saved me a lot of trouble. But if you haven't figured it out yet, at some point in your life, you're going to realize, boy, I got very little control. We don't have trouble controlling ourselves let alone the world and the people and the circumstances and the people all around us. Our trust has to be in the only one who is able. Jeremiah 33 says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which you know not. That's what it says in the King James. Do not understand is the new American standard. I think it really is that will blow your mind. Like things you can't conceive of, God is able to do. He is the only one. So how do we get there? I mean, how do we find these mind-blowing things of which we speak that the Bible talks about? Um, is there a magic formula? Maybe it's volume, right? If I said enough words or I say the right words, or maybe if I get enough people involved, maybe that will make it happen. Well, Scripture does say there's a couple key elements in prayer. The first one is the condition of the heart. James 5.16 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. David said in Psalm 16, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So there's a connection between the condition of the heart and prayer. Now, why is that important? Well, because this is a relationship. This is a communion with God. And sin, by its very definition, is when I tell God, you're not in charge. I'll do what I want to do instead of what you want to do. That's sin, right? In its essence, it's selfishness. It's me putting myself in the place of God and saying, I'm going to do it my way. I'll just do what I feel like doing. And so when we do that, our fellowship with God is altered. And we can't hear what God has to say because we're not in the right position. He's the creator, we're the created, but we're not aligned to hear what he has to say when we regard sin in our life. The second key is who it is we're praying to. Yusuf, he's Hindu, and he's a prisoner in Pakistan. I got a lot of prisoner stories, by the way. So here's his testimony. He says, I'm in jail, I did nothing. I'm here on a false case of stealing from my Muslim neighbor who accused me, and now I'm in jail. He said, while I was here, I met Chaplain Shaquille from Good News, who comes to the jail many times. I attend his classes because he welcomes all of us, and I listened about Jesus Christ, but I don't know anything about him. I don't know if he's alive or if Christians worship idols like Hindus, but in jail, I came to know that he is the alive God. He's not like our gods, which are made out of wood and mud and gold. Jesus is alive. Chaplain Shaquille is preaching about the living God who answers prayer. So it's difficult to compare this God to my idols, but I did, and the Holy Spirit touched me, and I prayed for God to show me the truth, and he showed me John 8, 32. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Now I know the truth. 
I've prayed to these idols many times, but they didn't answer. Now I pray to the true God. He sends me Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. So maybe you're not praying to wood and mud, okay? Venture, most of us probably aren't. Maybe we're not really praying at all, but I think often the focus of our prayer is not really the true person of God. The true God of the Bible. We kind of act like the God we're talking to is like a magic eight ball. Remember the game, right? You shake it up and you wait and you get an answer to your question. Or he's like a lottery ticket, right? You scratch and you, maybe you win, maybe you don't. So let's talk about the who. Who is it we're talking to? Who is this one who is able and whom we need to trust? If you've got your note page from your bulletin, draw a line down the middle, if you will. My recommendation, draw a line down the middle, the upper left. We're going to work on the left-hand side, and then we'll come to the right side. Upper left-hand side, right, the God who is. So we're going to talk about who this God is. Six things we're going to write, they're all P's, okay? So they're fairly easy to remember. If I was a good Baptist preacher, we'd only have three. But we got six, okay? So forgive me. I once did hear a sermon, 21 Ways to Express Agape Love from Romans chapter 12. 21, right? So this is easy. This is only six. Much easier than that. Okay, so let's talk about it. The first P is purpose, the God of purpose. In our Sunday school class, third to fifth grade boys, we start out every week, and one of the questions we ask is, why Sunday school? And the reason we ask it is because if someone's going to drag you out of bed and make you come to Sunday school, you ought to know why you're here, right? Makes pretty good sense. Pretty good sense. So, Toby Hansen, what's our number one reason why Sunday school? God has a plan for our lives. Three years and my brother got it, right? Now, he's a Hanson, so he got it in year one. So some of the others, it takes a couple years, okay? Thank you, Toby. God has a plan for our lives. And we tell the third through fifth graders, you are not a random pile of goo. You might look like one or you might smell like one, but you are not, right? There is a purpose for your life, and that's why you're here, to discover what God has to say about your life. God is a God of purpose. There's nothing that he does is random. It may not make sense to us, but there's nothing random about it. His ways are higher than ours, his thoughts than ours. Secondly, God of power. A sovereign God can move hurricanes. Plain and simple, he can do it. He can shut it down right now. He can flip the switch and that could be it. He has that power. He has that authority. He can do that. But the thing about God's power is we can't trust it a little bit and try to fix the rest of it ourselves, right? Isn't that kind of how we do? Lord, please, and then I'll go and do my thing. We've got to trust the omnipotent God to do what only he can do. He's the God of presence. God is with us. Scripture's clear. You've heard the verses. We remind children of them, and then we forget them as adults. This is the promise that God will never leave or forsake his children. If you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he hasn't left you. Pastor Cat, several years ago, I think when he was preaching, I wrote this in my Bible, he said this, don't doubt in the darkness what you know to be true in the light. What is his point? His point is that when things are going great, we feel the presence of God. And then when things are a mess, we say, God, where are you? He didn't move. He's still there. The God of provision, provision, excuse me. My God shall supply all my needs. Notice the word want doesn't occur in Scripture. If I asked you what you needed, you might quote the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right? That's what we need. No, you don't. What you need is you need faith. You need somebody to trust that is completely reliable and trustworthy and will never fail you. Who would that be? Christ alone. You need need to love, to give and receive love in an absolutely unconditional way. Where do you find that? Christ alone. You need hope, security, the knowledge that the future is secure no matter what's going on here. Where are you going to find that? Christ alone. So what is it you need? What does God provide? He's provided his son. That's your provision. God of provision. The God of protection. The God who knows all, sees all, cares for all. Hairs on your head, a few missing. Sparrows, he knows all of them. But I don't think that God's protection should be limited to our perspective, which is typically sickness and harm, right? We need God to protect us from being ill and from being destroyed. 
The truth is the protection that we need far greater than that is from the schemes of the world, the evil one. Satan wants to discourage you and he wants to deceive you. He started it in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, did God not say, and then he quoted scripture. He quoted God to Eve. And then he said to Eve, that isn't really what he meant. It doesn't mean that. Deception. Job's three Christian friends came to Job. Job's in the midst. He's lost everything except his wife. Isn't that interesting? Took his kids, all his stuff, all his possessions, all destroyed. But Satan left his wife. Think on that for a while. Okay. I'm just saying, it was her, not you. I'm talking about her, right? So he left her behind. Right? But the friends came along, Christian friends, and they said to Job, you know, Job, here's the problem. If you were a righteous guy, you wouldn't have this problem. Because God doesn't do, bad stuff doesn't happen to good people. So if you're a good guy, this wouldn't happen. And oh, by the way, Job, if you'd just clean up your act, then you'd be fine and it would all go away. That's a pretty discouraging thought. It wasn't true. Because we knew Job chapter 1, Job is a righteous man. Go through the whole world, he's it. He was number one. He was the most righteous guy there was, so we know that what they said was lying. But that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to discourage you. He wants to deceive you. He wants you to not believe that what God said is true. And he'll go to extreme lengths to prove it to you. Finally, the God of peace. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. What does that mean? It means that the child of God, the person who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, is no longer an enemy of God. There's only two sides. You're either a child of God or an enemy of God. And it doesn't mean necessarily that you hated God, but the fact is that your sin separates you from God. So we've been brought into a relationship with God. That's peace. We're not at odds with him any longer. And then Philippians 4 says the peace of God which passes all understanding, another mind-blowing thing, right? Passes understanding, meaning you can't even comprehend how great peace it, this peace is. Will guard your hearts and your minds. It comes from God. It comes through a relationship with God. By the way, the preceding verse was about prayer, so that's how it comes. So we have peace with God. Now we have the peace of God that nobody else can understand. How do you have peace when you live in Miami and when you come back, your house is gone? How does that work? How do you have peace when you got brain cancer? How does that work? How do you have peace when you lose a child or a loved one? How, how does that work? What only comes when your faith and trust is in the God of peace, the only one who can do it. So this is who we're praying to. This is the only one who is able. Who we have fellowship and communion with. Our faith is in him, our trust is in him, and in his word. Okay. So how then should we pray? Let's start. You already saw this on screen. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says pray without ceasing. Now I have people tell me that you can't really do that. Right? You can't really pray with that, like all the time. I mean, you gotta eat and you gotta talk and you gotta drive. You gotta do all these things. Pray without ceasing. Well, let's go back to our definition. Prayer, the most essential activity of the Christian's communion relationship with God through which the believer worships, honors, thanks the creator while seeking wisdom, instruction, grace, and intervention from the only one who is able. I think we can do that. Can we be worshiping, honoring, and thanking God on a regular basis? Absolutely. Can we be seeking wisdom and instruction and grace on a regular basis? Yes. Can we spend our every hour of every day asking God for stuff? No, that doesn't work very well. But then that wouldn't be prayer, would it? I do think there needs to be uninterrupted times of devoted prayer. I think Jesus demonstrated that. So we're Matthew chapter 6, you're still there, hopefully. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus, before he gives... The Lord's Prayer instruction, he gives us these instructions. Matthew 6, verse 5. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so they may be seen by men. Prayer is personal. It's private. It's not intended for public evaluation or presentation. Now, that's not to say that we don't pray in public. But the point of praying in public is not to let everybody know how spiritual you are. Or how many fancy words you know. Or that 
you know the right words to say. Most of us have heard a sermon disguised as a prayer before. You've been there. True prayer never says, look at me and look at what I've said. Okay? The next thing, prayer requires some quiet. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your father in secret. If you have children, there's very little quiet. I just thought of Kevin and Karen. So now I can actually say Kevin and Karen are here. I usually get that wrong when I speak. I usually say they're not here and then they are or one of them's here. So anyways, they were at the grandkids two weeks ago. Nice and quiet, I'm sure. I'm sure there's plenty of that, yeah. So maybe if you're looking for quiet, maybe when you go running instead of music, maybe you ought to try to pray. Now I can't do that. I've tried it because running is misery for me, right? So I can't run and pray. Maybe you can. But maybe when you go walking rather than music or whatever, maybe you leave the phone at home and maybe use that as prayer. I call that a walkie-talkie. See? (laughs) I didn't just make that up. I've been calling that for a while. So maybe when you're driving, you turn off the radio. I learned to do this. 20 years ago, I started a commute to Virginia. So every day it was 45 minutes or forever, right? Every day, back and forth. And I learned to turn off the radio, you learned to pray while I was driving. Now, you have to learn it, because after the first couple weeks, I was getting to the office and not really knowing how I got there. So you do have to, you have to practice that one a little bit. Um, but there's, there's times in our day when we're filling it with other things, when we actually could be focusing on prayer. The next is prayer requires listening. Verse six, it says, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He'll respond. But I believe it takes some time, right? It takes some time to kind of clear our mind and begin to focus and to really be think about what God, what we want to say to God and what we want him to say to us. And so you just can't do it on a flyby. You gotta stop. That's when you find wisdom, when you pray and listen. That's when we find purpose, pray and listen. And then finally, verse seven, prayer is not a ritual. When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Again, prayer is not a a test of how many words you can say, and the truth is the length of time is not the critical element. It's communion with God. So then what should we be praying about, I think is what it comes down to. My favorite illustration comes from a buddy of mine, home group meeting every week, and 85% of the prayer requests that were shared publicly were all medical. Now, that's not to say that God is not concerned about medical, but he thought, and I agree, that I think God is interested in more than hospitalization. Right? I think he is. So the day came when someone shared the request that put him over the edge. And the friend said, please pray that our homeowners association will approve the plans for our new shed. And my buddy lost it. He said, Jesus does not care about your shed. I don't know if he does or not. I really don't. But you get the point, right? We bring God our tragedies. We bring God our trivia. And there seems to be a whole lot more on God's agenda than that. So what should we be praying about? The right side of your paper, if there's any room left, we're going to put the peas again. Because my encouragement this morning is that you pray the peas. So on the right side, if you still have room, right, I should pray for the first P is purpose, that God would show his purpose in your life, the lives of those around you. Lord, show me what you want me to be doing. Show me what you're trying to teach me. Show me what you're trying to show me, particularly in the middle of the disaster and the chaos. Show me your purpose in all of this. I've found that when I understand the purpose, the task is a whole lot easier. 
right? When I understand what the objective is, wow, moving along even through difficult times is a whole lot easier to do because I know where we're going. So pray that God would show you his purpose. Pray for God's power, his strength, endurance, boldness. That God would show us how to rely upon him, not rely upon ourselves. I was in Douglas County Jail about two or three weeks ago, Douglas County, Omaha, Nebraska. So in there they have a, a group of men who participate in a program we call the Life Learning Program. People on the outside call it the God Pod. Right? So these gentlemen are 50 hours a week, are in classes studying the Word of God and studying life from a biblical perspective. So I had the opportunity to address them and uh, several of the inmates were sharing their testimonies with us and we came to a guy named Trevor. Trevor's lived a hard life. You can tell by looking at him. I couldn't tell you if Trevor was 25 or 55. It's that, it's that look, right? So you've got that visual. And Trevor said, you know, I've been out of, in and out of jail most of my life. I've been in this program here for a couple of weeks. He says, yesterday I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Right? That's the word, right? Surrender. The power of God in our lives requires us to surrender, give up what we're doing and say, okay, God, it's yours. You have to do it. Pray for power. Pray for God's presence. Not, Lord, just when I feel troubled, not just when it's hard, but pray that God would reveal his presence when things are going fine. I found that if I'm not asking God to show me his presence and demonstrate his presence, that I don't even recognize that he's there. You have to be looking for it in good and in bad. Pray for God's provision. Now, most of us would think that we actually got this one figured out, right? We all have a list. In my house, there's a list of stuff we'd like to have, right? The list begins with a pool, right? We want a pool. We want a hot tub. We want a dog. Not happening, right? <laughs> we want a unicorn. That's right. Unicorn's on the list. We want a Mini Cooper. And we want a Borgatti. I don't say it right. I think it's a car, right? Is somebody try me? Yeah. So anyways... That, that's our list. There's probably a few more like a horse, but if you got a unicorn, why do you need a horse, right? So, that, right, so, so there's, our, there's our list, right? We got a list. And I have promised that we will receive all of those on the same day. That's my promise, right? So when they come, it's all coming at once. I don't think God's very interested in our list. I really don't. I think he's interested in our needs. And when God provides us more than what we need, which, by the way, is about 98% of us. Speaking to myself, too. Potentially, when he provides above and beyond, potentially it's not so that we can buy more stuff. But maybe it's so that we could help somebody else. Potentially, it's so that we could give more. Potentially, it's so that we could be used in a different way that those resources might reach other people for the gospel. Maybe that's why he provides us with more. For God's protection. Satan is lurking. It's an evil place we live in, this world. And he wants more than anything else to sideline you and allow you to be useless. The Apostle Paul talked about being hot or cold. He says, if you're lukewarm, you're worthless. Because right? we don't know what you are. You, you don't represent either side very well. That's what Satan wants. That's what he wants to do, that we'd be minimized in terms of our impact. We need protection from the sin of the world, that our minds might remain pure, that God could use us in an effective way. Ask God for peace. Lord, give my heart rest. Help me to trust you fully. Free from anxiety, free from stress, free from conflict. Help me Allow me to be used as an instrument of peace in the lives of other people. That they too might discover your peace. Even in the most troubling of circumstances, allow the God of all peace to guard your heart and your minds. Pray the peas. I have a feeling that if we do that, we're getting a lot closer to where God wants us to be in our communion and relationship with him. And the reason I'm convinced of that is because they reflect the character of God. So I think this is what we should be praying for ourselves. 
This is what we should be praying for our children. This is what we should be praying for those around us. And this is what we should be praying for our world. One week from tomorrow, we kick off our missions week with a prayer meeting. Not a regularly scheduled event. Monday night, the 18th, 7 p.m. And the typical prayer meeting, I mean no disrespect, will have 20 people at it and they all have gray hair. Now I have gray hair, so maybe, but that's normal. Well, maybe the gray hairs know something that we don't. Maybe they're in tune with something that we're not. So let me encourage you to put it on your calendar and be here. We start that week talking about the needs of the world and talking about not just bless the missionaries, Lord, but what's my responsibility with regard to the gospel in my neighborhood and beyond? The truth is when you give to Faith Community Church, 25 cents of every dollar goes to missions and goes out beyond this church and this community to share the gospel, and that's wonderful. But I have a feeling that that's not it. What I mean is, that's not all. That if, if we just say, well, I've written my check, I'm good, I think God may have more to say about that. So I encourage you to be here. Again, the greater prayer is not just about the missionaries, but it's about you, it's about us, it's about me, it's about what does God want to do with us in our lives. So we're going to come together, mark it on your calendar, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to show us what we should be doing and ask him to speak to us about what our role is in the work of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, so many needs around us. And sometimes we just can't get past the tragedies and the trivia. We're grateful that you care about those things. We're grateful that you are willing to intervene. But our prayer, Lord, is that you would challenge our hearts, move in our lives, draw us to the place we need to be to hear from you, and that our prayer lives would be true communion and relationship with you, not just a list of things that we need and want. We trust that you'll challenge us here in the next couple of weeks. Next week as we talk about serving you, that you'd help us take away our calendar and our busyness and really ask ourselves the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? How can I be used in the lives of others? As we talk about missions, Lord, how can I be used in the life of missionaries and in the work of the gospel here and around the world? We ask that you'd shake us up a bit. We ask that you'd challenge us and that you'd speak to us. In your name we pray, amen.